of all implies that uh, so there is So if it's integrable, of course it has an integral. We can define the integral. And the integral is defined with a lower Dagu sum and the upper Dagu sums. That's one thing. And the other thing that we have is that uh, we also have that our uh, integral is between the lower Dagu sum and the upper Dagu sum for any partition p. Okay, that's part of our definition. Now, the, the problem number four deals with a sort of converse to this thing. Okay? What it tells you is the following. Assume that f is integral and that i is between the two Dagu sums for every p. Okay, that's what your assumption is, is that uh, your uh, number i is, in, is between these two numbers for every partition p. And the conclusion of the problem is show that i is necessarily our integral. Okay, so it's a sort of converse of uh, what we had. If f is integrable, then its integral is in between the two double sums for every p. Now the question is, knowing that f is integrable and that i is in between the two. Uh, the Bruce sums show that i is actually this number, which shows that uh, uh, if f is integrable, there is only one number with this property, and that's the integral. Okay, you cannot find another one. That's the only one. Now, if you are really brave, then you should ask yourself, uh, do I really need to assume that f is integrable? Okay? And is it enough? Let's say that I have a, fu a bounded function and, with, and I have a number i with this property. Does this prove that our function is integrable? And the answer to that is no. Okay, so you should provide a counterexample. But that's not part of a problem. Okay, it's Okay, other questions on the homework problems? Oh, the other question was about uh, number six. Number six is to compute integrals in, uh, in the way you do in calculus, but you are going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus to do that. So you need to justify the use of a fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, check your hypothesis that you do have a continuous uh, differentiable function and so that you can do this. Okay, so let's finish 6.1 and Let's go back uh, to the definition and theorem that define the, the integral. So let's assume that f is integrable on a, b. Then the least upper bound of lower Darbu sums
is equal to the greatest lower bound of upper double sums and that's what we call the interval um, of Okay, that's how we define our integral, but there are quite a few things to prove. We need to prove that we do have a greatest lower bound, a least upper bound, they are equal. Okay, we need, we need all that. Now, it's a good idea to uh, put ourselves in a more abstract setting and uh, look at the following level. So to prove this, uh, we are going to look at the following level. We are going to consider A and B two subset of rails, non-empty, with the following property, that if x belongs to A, y belongs to B, then x is less than 1. Okay, the set A is below the set B. That's all we are saying. And what else? We also assume that for every epsilon, uh, there exists an x in A, and there exists an y in B, so that uh, y minus x is between 0 and epsilon. Then uh, A has a least upper bound, B has a greatest lower bound, and they are equal. Now, what's going to play the role of A and what's going to play the role of B in our original question, in the question of uh, uh, showing that we have uh, this number, the interval? What's the set A? What's the set B? Yeah, A is going to be the set of lower Darboux sums. B is going to be the set of upper Darboux sums. These are real numbers. Okay, and this hypothesis is true because uh, that's the definition of being integral. Okay, your function is integral if for every epsilon you can find an upper minus a lower less than epsilon. Okay, so this is a true statement. So you see that this lemma is going to solve our problem. Uh, there is an issue with uh, the first hypothesis I'm going to talk about in a little while. Okay, because, well, maybe we should talk about it right now. Uh, let's see. So is this true? Is it true that any lower Darboux sum is less than any upper Darboux sum? What, what we have seen up to now is the following. Up to now, we, we have observed, and it's pretty clear, that we have this for every p. So is this property enough to say that our first hypothesis there, that every x needs to be uh, less than every y, is this, is this the same? Or do we need to do something else? We need to do something else. 
something else. What else? Because those X's and Y's could be uh, different P's. Exactly. Okay? What we need to prove is not that. That's not enough. It's with the same P. What we want is really to prove that L of FP is less than U of FQ for every P and Q. That's what we want. That's still a true statement. But uh, it's the so-called refinement lemma. Uh, so it's lemma three for those of you who are curious about this. And it's not very difficult, but uh, uh, you need to take into account many details to do it. And I, I won't do it. But anyway, so that's, that's why it's longer than what, what I'm going to do right now. OK, so let's prove the lemma. So we know that A is not empty, and we know that A has an upper bound. So could you give me an upper bound for A? Any Y in B, OK? Because X is less than Y for for any x and any y. So any y in B is an upper bound. So fundamental property of the reals, A has this upper bound. Same thing for B. B is different from the empty set. B has a lower bound. and actually any x in A. So same thing, fundamental property of the rails. B has a greatest, greatest lower, uh, lower bound. Yeah. And for that part, we only need the first hypothesis. Okay, the existence of uh, the, the least upper bound and great, greatest lower bound is really does not depend on this second hypothesis. The second hypothesis is useful to prove uh, that they are equal. And maybe we should give them names. Uh, well, let's, okay. So let's call this guy the least upper bound. This is going to be. Uh, sub of A, and this guy is going to be inf of B. It's easier to deal with. OK, so now we want to show, second step, we want to show that the supremum of A is equal to the infimum of B. That's what we'd like to show. So in order to do that, what we, we do is Yes, so uh, for y, OK, so for any y in B and x in A, we have that x is less than y. So y, as we noticed already, is an upper bound of A. But supreme of A is the least upper bound of A. So it has to be less than 1. OK, Y is an upper bound. You have your least upper bound, which is defined like this, it must be less than any other upper bound. It may be equal, but it cannot be bigger than. So you have this. Now, you, what you say is that the supreme of A
the superior of A is a lower bound of B. Right? It's a lower bound of B because for any Y in B, Y is bigger than superior of A. So, superior of A needs to be less than the infimum of B. Because this is the greatest of all the lower bounds. This is one lower bound, therefore we have this inequality. So the superior of A needs to be less than the infimum of B. Fine. Now we need to show that they are equal. So what we do is we pick our epsilon We pick an epsilon, and we know by hypothesis that there exists a y in b, and there exists an x in a, so that y minus x is less than epsilon. But y is bigger than m of b, of course, because y is in b, and x is less than Supreme of A. So y minus x is really bigger than infimum of B minus supreme of A. See, I'm just uh, multiplying this one by minus one to get the reverse inequality and then adding y minus x is going to be bigger than infimum of B minus supreme of A. But y minus x is itself less than epsilon. So for every epsilon, infimum of b minus supremum of a, which is a positive number according to what we did here, is less than epsilon. So how do I conclude? We, yeah, I could let epsilon equal 1 over n, for instance, and take the limit. Okay? Or directly use, this is one of the homework problems we did, that if your number is squeezed between 0 and epsilon for every epsilon, it has to be 0. Okay, so there are several ways to look at that, but in any case, this tells me that infimum of b minus supreme of a is 0, and I'm done with a proof of a lemma. Uh, see that it's crucial to know that you have a positive number here. Because a negative number is always less than epsilon. Okay? And you haven't achieved anything by just proving that. So you really need the double inequality. So that proves that Okay, so So that proves the lemma, and to, to apply the lemma, to A being the set of uh, lower Darboussons, and B upper Darboussons, We need to check that a lower Darboussin is always less than an upper Darboussin for every partition P, every partition Q. And to prove that, one needs the so-called refinement lemma, which is uh, interesting in itself, that says the following, that uh, 
L of F P is going to be less than L of F of P with Q, which is itself going to be less than U of F of P in Q, which is less than U of F of P. Uh, Q. Okay, so the way to prove this fact that L of FP is always less than U of FQ is to start with L of FP and then say, okay, I'm going to take the partition Q and I have a new partition here which is P union Q. So I'm putting more points. If I'm putting more points, I'm getting closer to the real area and I must be increasing my lower Darbusa. This is a well-known fact. It's the same partition, so I know that the lower Darbusam is less than the upper Darbusam. There is nothing new here. But then I say the following. By getting rid of points in my upper Darbusam, I get something bigger. Okay, it's less precise. I'm overshooting by more because I'm taking more points. So the upper and lower Darbusams go exactly inversely one of the other when you add points to the partitions. Okay, so it's quite natural, and if you have a picture of the rectangles that uh, I won't dare to draw, you, you see that the more rectangles you put, the smaller your upper Darbusam and the bigger the, your lower Darbusam. That's all. That's all we are saying here. It takes some work to write all the, the details, but it's not really that difficult. So, and once you have that, you apply the lemma, and uh, you can really uh, uh, justify the existence of the integral and so on. Questions? <laughs> okay, good. So, that, that's all we'll do in chapters in section 6.1. Now let's uh, try 6.2 and the new marker. Who knows? Is, uh, it's the properties of the interval, okay? Yeah, um, I'm going to be rather quick on some of this stuff. Um, okay. So what is called property S1 is that if C is a constant, uh, F is integral, then so is CF and the integral of CF between A and B is C times the integral of F between A and B. I should say here F integral on A B. Um, but th this type of property, you, you need to proceed in two steps. First step, you show that CF is integral, which is not very difficult. So integrable, remember, is that for every epsilon, I can find a partition such that U of F P minus L of F P is less than epsilon. Uh, there is a, an easy relation between your upper Darbus sum uh, of for F and the upper Darbus sum for C F. Okay, if C is positive, you multiply it by C, that's all. If C is negative, then your uh, your, front, your CF is upside down and uh, you have to be a little more careful. And so that's what the first step is. And then the second step you have to show that this is a true statement. 
which is not that difficult. What, what takes more time is to show integrability uh, every time. The second property is, so this is linearity just, so assume that f and g are, con are integrable on a, b, then of course uh, f plus g is integrable G is integral and the integral of f plus g is the sum. Okay, all things that are well known. Again, uh, it's the type of thing uh, that takes time for me to write and I don't think you would get that much. If uh, you know it's if you are interested in that, or if you are preparing yourself to graduate school, then you should read it and then ask me questions. It's the type of thing you need to read carefully because there are many steps, but none of them are very di are difficult. Just time consuming to get everything. So, following uh, property is the additivity of the integral, um, which is the following. So this time we assume that so assume that f is integral on a b and c is between a and b then f is integral on AC and CB and S of AB is actually the sum of S of AC plus S of CB. Okay. Okay, and so assume that, so this was, this is what I call S3. Now, uh, assume that F and G are integrable on AB and that F is less than G on a b then the integral of f is less than the integral of g Yeah, we probably should prove this last one. Uh, so, so uh, let's define H to be G minus F, and that's a positive function on A. Now, the, so you take any partition P of AB,
since H is a positive function on AB, then when I look at uh, uh, the greatest lower bound is necessarily bigger than zero because this is a lower bound of my function. Okay, all the values are above zero. Therefore, the greatest lower bound is necessarily above zero as well. And I should uh, actually do it for, so for x minus 1 xi rather than a. Then uh, your lower Darboux sum is Uh, these numbers m here we're doing h. These numbers m times x i minus x i minus one. And you see that if this is positive, since this is positive, the whole thing must be positive. Okay, you are summing positive numbers. So L of H P is a positive number. Now remember that Uh, the integral of h is between the lower Darboux sum and the upper Darboux sum. And so we we get that uh, our integral of h must be positive. Okay? It's bigger than the lower Darboux sum, and the lower Darboux sum is positive, so it's going to be positive. And now we can use linearity to say that this is f minus, uh, it's g minus f. This is g minus f, which is g plus minus f, which is this. Okay, this. These are the properties S1 and S2. And this is positive, and therefore uh, we get what we want. Okay, something that I should have said here is that since uh, G and F are integral, H is integral. Okay, this is uh, two of the properties we stated before. And you can, uh, when you are uh, justifying your claim, just say operations on integrable functions. That's, that's all it is. You are subtracting two integrable functions, you get an integrable function. Okay, so if my function is positive, I get an in a positive integral. And uh, if a um, uh, function is less than the other one, then the integrals are in the same order. Now let's look at an application of that. So we are going to assume that our function is continuous. So assume that f is continuous on AB and f is positive on AB. Then if assume also that the integral is zero. 
then f is f of x is equal to 0 for all x in AB. Okay, so the proof of that, so let's prove a counterpositive of that. So let's assume that uh, our conclusion is not true. Okay, the conclusion is not true, so we don't have f of x equals 0 for all x, which means that we have at least one x for which f of x is different from 0. But remember that, uh, and let's call it a instead of x. No, let's not. Okay, c. So, uh, but uh, we are also assuming that our function is positive or zero. Therefore, if it's different from zero, it means that f of c is strictly positive. It cannot be negative. So we know we have a, a point where our function is strictly positive. And graphically, the idea is quite simple. Our c is here, f of c is somewhere here. Because our function is continuous, we are going to be able to find the delta around c where the function is strictly positive. Or actually better than that, is bigger than f of c over 2, so that we get a lower bound. And then we're going to say, well, this thing here has an area which is at least uh, 2 delta times f of c over 2, which is f of c times delta, which is a strictly positive number. And then we have to take care of the other part of the interval, that this part must be positive or 0, and this part must be positive or 0. So we end up with something which is at least this, and we're done. Okay, so let's uh, do it. First step, uh, let, let's take epsilon equal to f of c over 2. And in the test, so many of you picked f of c over 2 when they should have picked minus f of c over 2. Be careful, your epsilon needs to be positive. So in the test you had a negative function, don't make your epsilon negative, okay? Take the opposite. <coughs> Excuse me. So, epsilon is f of c over 2. There exists a delta by continuity, so that if x minus uh, c is less than delta, then f of x minus f of c is less than epsilon. Then we get that f of x is bigger than f of c minus epsilon, which is f of c over 2 for all x in c minus delta c plus delta. Right? We have a double inequality. I'm just picking, I'm just uh, keeping the one I need, that's all. So I have this, and now what do we do? We say, well, the integral, okay. so we say that the integral from A to B 
of f is the integral from a to c minus delta plus c minus delta c plus delta plus c plus delta b. Okay, we can split our integral in as many pieces as we want. This thing here is bigger than c minus delta c plus delta f. This is because our function f is positive. So because it's positive, the integral is positive too. So if I get rid of this piece and this piece, I get something smaller, which is what I'm writing here. Am I going too fast? Okay. So we get this. Now, on c minus delta c plus delta, we have this inequality. We can replace f by the constant f of c over 2. So we would get c minus delta c plus delta f over c over 2. That's a constant. That's not the function f anymore. It's just the value of, uh, of f at c. But the integral from c minus delta c plus delta of f of c over 2 is really uh, the rectangle f of c over 2 times 2c, two, uh, 2 delta. Which is delta fc, which is strictly positive because f of c is strictly positive and delta is strictly positive. Okay. So the conclusion on that is that the integral from A to B of F is at least delta F of C. Of course, delta could be ridiculously small, but still a positive number. So we get this, which shows that our integral is strictly positive. So we started with non-B and we ended up with non-A. It's not a zero integral. And we are done. Now, where was is it crucial to know that our function is continuous? Or was I just too lazy to do it the hard way without continuity? Yeah, otherwise we don't know this. We cannot do this. We don't have an interval where it's uh, bigger than something. We don't have a rectangle. We have nothing. And it's actually not a true result. Because just think of a function which does this, is 0. Then at c, it jumps. Then it's 0 again. This thing is integrable, and its integral is 0. But it's not 0 everywhere. At c, it's not 0. So it doesn't work if it's not a continuous function. Yeah, uh, we need to be careful about these inequalities. And, okay, so let's. Um, sometimes you don't know uh, which is the smaller. Number You don't know whether A is smaller than B or B is smaller than A. That happens. Because, for instance, you're looking at B as being a variable. So B could be anything in R, let's say. So in that case, it's, a, it's good to know, well, or to define, that's the definition, that uh, uh, you can inverse your bound, and then you get the opposite. But also, then, you need to be careful because the type of inequality, like when you say f of g, f is less than g implies uh, integral of f less than integral of g. This is true if a is less than b. Otherwise, it's not true. 
it's the reverse, which is true, because you'll need to multiply by minus 1 and get the other inequality. So in some instances, it's very important to know whether A is less than B or not. Okay, and that, that goes to the, when you're comparing two functions, you, and with inequalities, you need to know which number is less. So uh, remember that. I mean, that's, that's an important point. Now, when you are dealing with equalities, like the type of thing we wrote, uh, when you write this, for instance, then it doesn't matter. Because it's an equality, it's always true. A, B, and C can be in any order you want. It's still going to work. But, of course, you need A, and you need C, and then you need C, you need B, in order to get A, B back. That is not uh, free. But uh, the, knowing where A, B, and C are is not important. Of course, we stated the, the result for uh, C strictly between A and B, but it's a more general result. And the other thing uh, that you define is that the integral from A to A of F is always zero. That's just a convention. OK. So operations on integrable functions, we have seen uh, that you can multiply by a constant, that you can add them, then subtract them. Um, Multiply them. You can multiply them and still get something which is integrable. That will be part of your homework. However, composition is trickier. If you compose two integrable functions, you may get a monster which is not integrable. So that's different from differentiability. And so the, the result is the following one. So the result is that yeah. So assume that G is continuous and F is integrable. Then. The composition of G and F is integral. Uh, that's kind of a hard proof. It's it's in uh, so there is a a Bible for all these results, which is the uh, the book of Rudin, Walter Rudin which is called Principles of Analysis of Mathematical Analysis. So he claims that he needed a book. He was going to teach the class in the late 40s at the University of Wisconsin and wasn't happy with the books, sat down for a summer, wrote the book, and it's been a bestseller since then. But it slowly became from something which was done at the undergraduate level, it slowly became something more undergraduate slash graduate. So there are many results, but it's very dry. He's from Austria and doesn't like to waste his time. And uh, so, but everything is there and it's very elegant, very beautiful. And his other books are wonderful too. Anyway, so uh, that's where you would go to get the best possible result. Here, we don't do the best possible uh, because we can just, you see, there is a particular case which is uh, of interest, which is to take uh, f, in, f continuous and g continuous. If f is continuous and g is continuous, then g composed with f is continuous as well. 
display, we have proved that that's not very difficult. And we also know that continuous implies integ integrability. Okay? So instead of two pages, we do it in one line. And this is really a very important particular case because most of our functions are continuous. So, okay, so let's go to absolute value and integrability. Uh, let's assume that f is integral. Then absolute value of f is integral. And we have the following inequality. So when I take the absolute value of the integral, it's less than the uh, integral of the absolute value. Okay, and the proof is quite easy. Uh, first thing, absolute value of f is really g with f, where g of x is absolute value of x. So, absolute value of f as a composition of integrable and the outside function continuous, uh, and the order is important in the theorem which is there, um, tells us that this is integrable. Okay, the, the property does not work if you do first integrable, then continuous. That's because you, you want to finish with continuous because continuous is nice, it uh, makes it regular. So you take something which may be nasty here, but then you take continuous so you get something nice. If you do a reverse, you have something nice and then you, you do something horrible to it, maybe it's not so nice. Okay? So that's why it's, uh, it's important to know in which order the thing works. But again, in most cases, our f is continuous, absolute value is continuous, we know that composition of continuous continuous. Fine, so we have this. Now, uh, there are two cases. First one, your integral is positive. Then the absolute value of your integral is itself. And we know that f is less than absolute value of f. So the integral of f is less than the integral of the absolute value. So on one hand, we know that the absolute value is equal to the integral. On the other hand, we know that the uh, integral is less than the integral of the absolute value. So we put these two together, and we get that, so by putting this and this together, we get that the absolute value of the integral is less than the integral of the absolute value. Okay? Second case, the integral may be negative. Then the absolute value of the integral is minus the integral. 
And this bilinearity is the integral of minus f. Okay, you can always put your constant inside or outside. Fine. Now, uh, this time what you're going to say is that minus f is always less than absolute value of f. Is that always true? If I take the opposite of a number, is it always less than the absolute value of a number? Yes, of course. The absolute value is either the number or its opposite. So we know that this is a true statement. We take the integral. And again, we are in good shape because this now we, we use this here to say this is less than absolute value of uh, integral from A to B of absolute value of F. For those of you who don't know what they'll be doing during the break, let me give you some homework. So this will be from November 30th, I guess, which should be one week from Thanksgiving. Okay, last homework. So 6.2, well, last that I will grade at least. 6.2 is going to be 6. 8, 9, 10, 13, and 14. Questions? Okay, so we'll go on with this on Tuesday, I guess.